Lynch, and welcome to the My Digital Farmer podcast. In today's market, it's not enough to just grow your product. You've got to know how to sell it, too. Welcome to the My Digital Farmer podcast, where we reveal online marketing strategies and tips to help farmers like you get better and more confident at marketing. Learn how to find more customers, increase your sales, and build a strong brand for your farm. Let's start the show. Welcome to episode 87 of the My Digital Farmer podcast. I am your host, Corinna Bench from Shared Legacy Farms, CSA, out in Elmore, Ohio. Also the founder of MyDigitalFarmer.com, which is all about trying to help other farmers become more confident and more competent at their marketing and sales. So if you're one of those farmers that feels like you've got it down, you know how to produce your product and create a, a great product from the field, but you're not necessarily sure how to go about selling it, then this podcast is for you. Every week I show up with some kind of a nugget or an interview or a guest to help us get a little bit better at that. I'm really glad you're here today. If you're here for the first time, a special welcome to you. I hope you enjoy the show and I want to encourage you to hit the subscribe button right now so that you can grab this podcast every single week when I drop a new episode on Wednesdays. If you're one of my regular listeners, hello. I'm so glad you're here again today and I want to say a special Thank you to all of you for supporting me over this entire season, this entire year. We're coming to the end of 2020, and I've been reflecting a lot on what um, I've been able to accomplish with this podcast, how much fun it has been, what I've learned along the way, and I just can't believe that I'm already at another end of another season. So thank you for all of you who continue to listen every week. I want to also wish you a Merry Christmas because that is coming up in just a few days. I'm releasing this podcast the Wednesday before Christmas Eve. So if you are celebrating that holiday this season, um, I just want to wish you all a wonderful, wonderful Christmas. And I hope you have some time with your family. Well, today's episode is going to be all about how to articulate your product's promise to your customers and your customer prospects. And you'll be able to find the show notes from today at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 87. I wanted to start out today by reading a few uh, excerpts from this past season's survey results from my farm because I feel like it's a great introduction to what I want to teach today. So just sit back and listen to some of these comments that came into our survey. The question that I asked to try and pull these different responses out was I was asking them, what were some of the results that you experienced this year from our CSA? Or what was something new that you learned uh, this year during our CSA season? All right. So just kind of listen to what some of the people said. And this is literally taken right from the survey. So it might sound a little bit choppy, but this is how people typed it out. When we first started, I had no idea how I was going to find time to make all these veggies. We had a seven month old and we were eating out constantly. I slowly started gaining more confidence in the kitchen. And by the end of the season, I literally made my own chicken noodle soup on a random day without a recipe or prior planning. I was amazed. I've made so many new things and we have saved so much money eating at home. Okay, that's the first one. Here's the second one. And I want you to just listen to some of the specific results that they're talking about, the, the highlights, the things they remember from the season, okay? We now put squash in our chili, Swiss chard in salads and stir fry, kale in soups. We planned our meals around the veggies in the box. It was a fun challenge and got our whole family excited about eating new veggies. My kids loved it. I'd never seen a tomatillo or a ground cherry and was excited to try them both. We tried lots of new recipes to use the veggies we would never have thought to buy at the store. All right, this is the third one. I cooked a lot more on a good week, three to four meals. And considering this was up from pretty much zero, it was a big improvement for me. By cooking, I ended up eating more healthier than buying store food. I've also learned a lot more about how to store or use the vegetables, which makes me more confident trying to eat healthier moving forward. Oh, that's a good one. And then finally, the last one, it's short and sweet. 
I actually ate beets this year. Without my CSA, I wouldn't be trying new veggies. Okay, so what do all four of those responses from our survey results have in common? <laughs> well, they are vignettes that describe specific results my CSA customers experienced after using my product. And in today's episode, I want to talk about why knowing these specific vignettes, these specific results that you get for your customer with your product, why that is such marketing gold, why you must make this your mission this year to figure out this information if you don't already know it, and why you may want to consider leading with this angle in your marketing assets. When you know the result that you get for people, your product will sell better. Now, we've been doing a book study right now inside of my private Facebook group for farmers. It's called the CSA Marketing Discussion Group. If you don't know about it yet, I want to encourage you to go and request access. I'll let you in. We've been doing a book study of Donald Miller's best-selling marketing book called Building a Story Brand. And we just covered one of the chapters, which was all about how we need to articulate what success looks like for uh, the hero in our brand story, which is our customer. And so that's kind of what prompted this episode today because it really, uh, it really hit me hard that this is a key selling concept. This is really a driver for sales. So I wanted to spend some time diving more deeply into that. One of the things he says, this is actually the principle of that particular chapter. He says, never assume people understand how your brand's product can change their lives. Tell them. So I actually have a story to tell that I think articulates this really well. Um, this past week, if you have been on any kind of a Zoom call with me, you will have noticed, or if you've been in my Facebook group and I've been trying to do videos, you may have noticed that I'm having some internet issues. And this is not normal for me. Like I don't, I do a lot of Facebook Live videos. I do a lot of Zoom calls. I have been for a long time and I've never had issues. All of a sudden, a couple of weeks ago, I started having problems where I would... I would just drop out of the Zoom call. And it kept happening actually with the same client. And after the second time, I was kind of embarrassed about it because you know here I'm supposed to be kind of a marketing expert and I can't even get my technology to work right. And so I finally called the internet provider because first I thought, well, maybe it's just like a weird fluke thing. I live out in the country, but it was happening consistently to the point that it wasn't reliable anymore. And so I, I reached out to Amplex. They're my internet provider. They're kind of like the only one around here. So I don't have a lot of options. And I just said, Hey, this is what's happening. Um, do you have any idea why this might be happening? Like, could you check and see if I'm crazy? Cause I know they can see the data from their side. So they went and looked at my account and they're like, you know what? I don't, I don't see anything. Your internet looks fine right now. And I was talking to a younger kid. I could tell he was maybe like new to the team. And, and so I said, well, okay, well, can you just, um, can you just maybe recommend, like, is there something I could do? Because I'm not crazy. This has been happening for two weeks. Do you have any idea why, why this might be happening? And so then he suggested that I bump up to the next level subscription to, to get more data, like more power coming through the, the Wi-Fi. And I was like, okay, well, let's try that because I need to get back on this call. And right now I can't get back on the call. So maybe that will help. And he's like, yeah, I think that'll work because Zoom, you know, takes a lot of data, blah, blah, blah. So he, he makes the switch. I get off the call. I get back onto Zoom and I'm in the call for another like three minutes and then I get dropped again. I'm like, okay, yeah, that didn't work. So I'm back on the phone again and I'm talking to a different guy this time. And I say, listen, I don't know what just happened. I just got upgraded to like twice as much as I'm paying and it didn't work. So I need you to help me figure this out. And this guy then proceeded to walk me through a whole bunch of other steps. And he's like, well, here's what I think might be happening. And he started like it was five minutes of him trying to be helpful, but he was talking tech talk. Have you ever had that happen with someone where they begin to speak about cables and megahertzes and like, I don't even remember the words he was using. I didn't recognize them. And after a while, I thought, okay, I think he thinks he's being helpful right now. I think he's trying to justify why he wants to do what he's about to do next with my account. But I finally like stopped him and I said, hey, listen, is this going to make my internet reliable and hassle-free? 
And he paused and he said, oh, I'm sorry. I know sometimes I start talking like a tech guy. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. That's basically what's going to happen as a result of us fixing this. And I said, do it. Make it happen. I need to get on this call. <laughs> and we moved forward from there. So uh, turns out that wasn't the problem. I had to call a third time and get my router fixed. But my point of this story is that at the end of that conversation, I had to stop him and I pretty much gave him the result that I was looking for. <laughs> All I cared about was, is whatever you're going to do, is it going to make my internet reliable and hassle-free? Okay, that was the result that I was looking for. And that's all he needed to tell me. He didn't need to talk me through the features and the step-by-step -step bullet points of what this package was going to do for me. I just wanted to know that it was gonna get me results. I wanted to be able to use my internet. I wanted to not be able to notice my internet, right? I didn't even wanna have to think about it. That's what I care about as the consumer, okay? So if we were to back off from this example and kind of look at myself as the customer, and say, what was the result that I cared about? If you're trying to sell an internet service to me, what do I care about? All I care about is that you're gonna make my internet experience reliable and hassle-free. You don't have to talk crazy jargon and spell out all these bullet points of features and benefits. I just wanna know that my internet's gonna work when I want it to, okay? So when you're talking about your product, are you doing what this Amplex guy was doing to me, are you focusing so much on the on the, the little features and the bullet points and what you get, but you're not talking about the results? Because that is a marketing mistake. And I want to challenge you today to start acting in a different way. I want you to identify what is it that my customer wants? What is the result that I can pretty much promise that my product will provide for them? Because it has for the majority of my customers. So in Donald Miller's book, he asks this question, which is such a provocative question, and I want you to take some time maybe to journal about it or talk about it with your business par partner this season. Where is your brand taking people? What is your product's promise? One of the things that we talk a lot about here at Shared Legacy Farms is we say, listen, if you're with us long enough, we are literally going to change the way you eat. And that's sort of a big overarching promise. And I'll talk a little bit more specifically here in a minute about very specific results that we can promise them. But in a nutshell, we're changing the way people eat over time. But I want you to ask yourself, what is life going to look like for your customers if they start using their pro your product? What is life going to feel like? How will life be different? I call this the gaping chasm conundrum. So if you imagine this giant valley, you know, a chasm between two cliffs, and your customer is standing on the precipice of one of these cliffs, and they want to get to the other side of that chasm, to the other cliff side, and they don't know how to cross that chasm. It's too big of a gap. And so they're coming to you and hoping that your product is going to help become the bridge to get them over that, all right? Whatever that chasm is, what is that problem? What is that thing that they want to get over? And what is the what does life look like on the other side for them? That's what they want. And they're willing to pay you to get there. So when you know what the reward is at the end of the journey, at the end of the finish line, you'll be able to sell more of your product because once you articulate that to them and they resonate with it, they are on board with you. I was thinking about the power of rewards and it made me think about the time that I was trying to woo my husband, Kurt. This is back when we lived in Chicago and we were sort of dating on and off and I really, really liked him and I was trying to get him to take me more seriously and, you know, just basically to fall crazy in love with me, right? And so I knew that he liked to run. I hated to run. I still hate to run. But I decided, you know what, I'm going to try to run the Shamrock Shuffle with him in Chicago and maybe that will impress him. Okay, so this was kind of my new challenge. And if you don't know what the Shamrock Shuffle is, it's a really fun race. Well, no race is fun if you ask me, but if you are a runner, 
uh, you probably would enjoy the Shamrock Shuffle. It's a 5K race. It goes through the streets of downtown Chicago. So it's really fun because there's lots of things to look at. You're going through the different districts. They clear out the traffic. So it's just a bunch of racers running through the streets. And you really get to see the city. And there's thousands of people that run this. And, you know, I could barely run a half a mile before I was going to pass out. So I had to actually train for like two months to be able to run a 5K. And if you guys are all runners out there, you're probably laughing at me. I did have to train just so that I could make it. And my goal was just not to walk. I wanted to be able to jog or run very slowly. Even if it was just super slowly, I wanted to be able to run the whole thing. And more importantly, I wanted to be able to impress Kurt. I wanted to be able to show him that I could keep up with him and we could have this experience together where we're running together and he would think, wow, she's so cool. I love that she loves to do what I do. All right. So I train and I train for two months and I was devoted to the training. I would run around my, my neighborhood like 10 times because I figured out how long a 5k was. And I ran that amount. And I worked my way up to until I could actually run a 5k and not die. And so sure enough, we went and we ran the shamrock shuffle together and he stayed with me all the way to the end. He was very sweet, even though I was super slow and we finished it together. And then I never ran another, (laughs) another race again. Uh, but I think it did the trick. He was impressed. So the reason I tell this story is because I was motivated to do something that I didn't necessarily love doing, but I did it And I got to the finish line because I wanted something really bad. And I knew what that looked like. It's like, I want to get closer to this guy. I want to impress this guy. And I'm going to do that. We need to know what it is that drives our customers to buy our products. Where do they want to get to? What does success look like for them? Because people are motivated by the success, by the promise of success, by that reward. When you can clearly identify the carrot that's dangling from the stick, the, da- the carrot they're chasing after, they will move forward with you. So some of the questions that you can think through as you're trying to figure this out are what does your customer have before they use your product and what do they have after they use your product? Another question you could ask is, what do your customers feel before they use your product? And how does that feeling change after they use your product? Okay. Spend some time like really journaling about that and writing out some specific answers because that's going to help you kind of see what's, what's the result they're driving after. What are your customers believing or knowing before they use your product? And how does that change? How do their beliefs and their knowledge change after they use your product? And then how is their average day different? How does their life literally change on an average day basis because of your product? That's an especially powerful one when it comes to the CSA product. Now, why do we need this information as a marketer? Why do we need to be so focused on knowing the results, the specific results that we give to our clients? Well, when we are armed with this information, we can more clearly talk about where we are taking our future prospects in our messaging and in our marketing because it is the stories of where we're taking them, the future pacing, the vision casting, that's what drives people to buy. They imagine their life being different. They want to get there and it's the results that sell. And now a quick word from our sponsor. If you're a farmer that's thinking about starting a new CSA, one of the things you're likely wondering about is, what do I put in the box each week? Whether you decide to become a choice CSA or a traditional one like I have or something in between, trying to figure out what to grow so you have enough product each week consistently is often tricky. Well, I have a short resource guide that will help. It's something I offer my CSA Quick Start students and it's called Building the Perfect CSA Box. It's a 13-page visual PDF guide that helps you learn the formula for a great box so you can wow your customers every time with variety. My husband, Kurt, now uses this formula in this guide to help our farm map out our box plan every year. It makes creating the crop plan and production schedule so much easier. You can grab this resource to help your own CSA production plan get started at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash perfect box. And now back to our show. 
So if we can identify the right stories and the right words that are con- going to connect with our customers, with our prospects, they are going to connect with us. They're going to start trusting us and they're going to follow us. Now, when we choose these stories, these result-based stories, they need to be as specific as possible. So this is a thought exercise that I want you to work on to get better at this. I want you to imagine that you are writing a screenplay for a movie and you need to select a scene or write out a scene where your customer experiences success or results with your product, okay? What is that climactic scene? What does it look like? There are probably so many that you could choose from, but I want you to, uh, if you could take like a snapshot of the moment and then try to relive it and put it into a screenplay, what would it look like? I'm gonna share a few examples of this for you just to get your mind spinning. This is how I want you to think. I want you to get really specific. So Mindy is one of my CSA customers. She walks into her kitchen at five o'clock with confidence. It's time to make dinner, but she's not worried. She pulls out the giant cast iron pot and she's decided she's going to make her husband's favorite chili. So she grabs all the ingredients, starts chopping away, throws them into the pot, gets the recipe going. And in the final step, she decides to throw in some pureed green cubes from the freezer, an exit strategy that she recently learned last week from the CSA Facebook group. And she does this as a way to hide some of that frozen kale she got from her box the other week and she didn't know what to do with it. And she's going to try to sneak in those veggies so her kids don't even know that they're in there. At dinner time, her husband raves about the dish, says it's delicious as usual. She can tell her kids love it too because they are gobbling it down. And no one ever knows that she secretly stashed a bunch of greens into that recipe. And the camera zooms in on her face as she knowingly smiles as if she has a secret. Mindy feels like a hero. She just got her picky eaters to eat some kale. Okay, so that is a scenario that I know has happened in my CSA because I've heard this story so many times. And every time somebody tells it, they are telling it with pride. Like this is a huge victory for them. The problem, they can't get their family, their kids to eat new varieties of vegetables or they have picky eaters. And so they find ways to get them to eat those veggies anyway without even knowing it. And they still think it's delicious. So um, that's a great example of a vignette that you could create and talk about as an example of, hey, we get results. This is the kind of thing that happens to you specifically when you join our CSA. A story like this may likely happen to you. Here's another one. Um, It's January and one of my CSA members, let's call her Liz is walking through Kroger and she spots the colored peppers, which are like $2 a piece. They look gorgeous, but she's thinking to herself, huh, good thing I don't need to spend money on those because they're kind of a lot of money, right? She smiles and passes it by knowing that she froze 10 quarts of red peppers from her CSA a couple of months ago, and her freezer is super stashed. She won't have to buy a red pepper until July. So I tell this story because, again, I hear this from so many people, how they love that they can stash up on these peppers when they come, when they're coming out of our ears and they get them in, you know, droves in their CSA box and the smart people will throw them into freezer bags and save them and be eating off of their freezer for the rest of the winter. And they feel smart, right? They feel like a winner as a result of that. 
That is an example of a story of success. That is a win in our book. This is what success looks like. Our customers learn how to freeze their food and then they end up feeling like a ninja later because they're not having to spend a whole bunch of money on stuff when it's really expensive. All right, and here's another example. My last one. Evelyn is preparing a veggie tray for her Christmas gathering. It includes uh, the usuals like celery and cucumbers and carrots, but it also has kohlrabi sticks. And as she lays it out onto the table, her guests come and they pull out the carrots and the cucumbers and the dip and they make their own trays. But her kids run up and the first thing they grab from the tray are the kohlrabi sticks. And they tell their friends and their cousins, you should try these. They're so good with peanut butter. And the mom thinks to her, Evelyn, thinks to herself with a smile, only in my family. And she says that with pride. Okay. I've heard this story also several times from my CSA customer. Again, this feeling of the CSA helps my, my kids get exposed to different foods that they would never eat. And there's a sense of elevated status in their comments as they tell me this, like my family's different than other families because we know what good food is and we have a broader palate and they take pride in that, okay? This is the kind of change that happens when somebody is in our CSA. I just gave you three examples of little vignettes that you can create for your own farm. I want you to find the snapshot moments that define success for you. And if you know your customers well enough and you've researched them, you will be able to identify these quickly, all right? And once you have, I don't know, like five of these, just kind of jot them down, have a rough idea of what they would be. Here's what you're going to do with those as a marketer, okay? Why is it important that you have these? Well, remember, it's these success stories that cast vision for your future members, but also your current members, your current customers. So here are some things that you can do with them. Number one, you can talk about these vignettes in your social media posts. So talk about the results you get people in your social media strategy. You can create a section on your website that has little bullet points, maybe five bullet points, that basically spell out five different results that your product gets people, how you change their world, how you change their life. You could take a picture of one of these vignettes, okay, you could stage a shot that basically encapsulates this story at one glance and then put that on your marketing assets, whether it's on your website or in your social media strategy, on your Instagram. Um, I have a picture of a woman named Tammy, who's one of my customers, who was in her kitchen unboxing her box and she started chopping up her tomatoes and making this gorgeous salsa with them and this beautiful dish on her uh, that she made with some chicken and some different pasta. And I sent a photographer into her house and I said, I want you to take a picture of her during this whole hour long process as she's unboxing her box and just starting to make a meal. Now, Tammy knew this was going to happen, and she gave permission, but I got a bunch of great photographs of the process of Tammy cooking and having fun, and she had a glass of wine next to her. Like, you could see this was an experience. So this is what I'm talking about. You need to find those stories, those vignettes that describe success, and put them on your marketing assets so other people can see them, and then they imagine themselves in that picture. They imagine themselves in that moment. And they say, that's what I want too. Can this brand get me there? It looks like they can. And they'll be more likely to take that next call to action step that you want them to take. Another way that you can use these kinds of vignettes and stories is when you talk to a customer or a prospect face to face. So if you're doing basically a sales job on a person at the market, for instance, or on the telephone, if they're calling and asking about this product, don't just talk about the features that come with your offer. Don't just say, well, you get a newsletter with recipes and um, you get certified organic product. Don't just do that. Instead, lead with the stories. Talk about how, you know, when you're in my CSA, after a couple years, I can pretty much guarantee that you're going to start to XYZ. And you start listing off these behaviors and these 
thoughts and mindsets that your customers have. You can say things like, um, I can pretty much guarantee that you're going to learn how to freeze just about everything. And you're going to find that you have a freezer full of produce that you can live off during the winter months. And you won't be spending as much money at the grocery store. Or you can say, you're going to find that your kids actually get exposed to lots of different kinds of vegetables and it'll change the way they eat forever. And they're going to be so much more than just the basic like chicken noodle soup and pizza and hot dogs. Like they're going to learn how to love how to eat vegetables, right? So you'll be able to say those kinds of things on a phone call with someone. Talk about how life is different. Talk about the results because that's what's going to make someone decide to buy, not the specific bullet points and features of your offer. You can also put this information into an email sales sequence. So if you do email marketing like I do, spend an entire email or two sharing one of these stories about the results that one of your customers gets and that they will likely get as well. You could talk about them in your Facebook group. So I have a Facebook group for CSA members only, and I share these stories in there too. And that's important because a lot of my CSA members, or a percentage of them every year, are rookies, and they're not super awesome at using the box right away. And this becomes a, an encouragement to them when they hear stories about this is what you can become, this is what our members eventually become. It helps them to keep going because they think, well, that will be me someday if I just stick it out. You can also take these results stories, these little vignettes, and post them as testimonials, especially if they are handwritten by a member. Um, you can craft that testimonial and put it out there on your social media and just say, this is an example of a person and how they feel about our CSA, how their life has changed. Now, you're going to find these specific results from your customer research. That's why I talk about how important it is to know who your ideal clients are. You need to know them like the back of your hand. You need to have your finger on the pulse of your customer base. And if you haven't taken the time to do customer research, I want you to make that a priority this coming winter. We did not do customer research until our seventh or eighth year of our business. And the minute we did it, a deep dive, and I interviewed people on the phone, and I did a really great survey with the right kinds of questions in it. It was the best thing, hands down, we ever did for our business. It was the catalytic moment that, that pivoted everything um, for our marketing strategy. Kurt will say that as well to this day, that once we did that, everything shifted in how we delivered our product, how we talked about our product, how we um, supported our members through the experience. It was huge. So I encourage you, if you haven't done it, take the time this winter to get on the phone and talk to some of your best customers to figure out what drives them. Now, if you need some help figuring out how to do customer research, I have a workshop, a course for that, which is going to walk you step by step through the process of creating a really great um, survey. It's going to walk you through the kinds of questions you should talk through with people on the telephone and how to take those results and analyze them and use them then in your marketing as well. If you want to learn more about that, you can go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash research. Now, <clears throat> one of the questions that I used in the last two surveys of uh, our last two seasons that was really powerful was basically this one. What is uh, one of your favorite memories of the season that you'll never forget? And that particular question pulled out a lot of these results type stories that I now can use when I'm talking about my product. Another great question is, what's one thing that you learned this year? Um, you can put that in your survey and you'll get very similar kinds of results-driven uh, responses. Okay, so that's just kind of a bonus tip right there. So as we wrap up this year, 2020, I want you to get clear about what specifically you do for your people. I know you grow vegetables or I know you you're a meat producer, but so what? Like, how is your product changing their lives? What does that life change look like specifically? How does it manifest itself? Get really clear. Know those stories. And how long does it take for that change to happen? That's also an important detail that you should know. For us, it's not immediate. Like, we specifically deliver 
certain pieces of content and teaching to rookies at the beginning to get quick wins because we know we need to give them some kind of a, a boost that makes them feel like they've made progress early on to keep them motivated. But we know that learning how to cook with a CSA box in the traditional CSA format, that takes about two to three years to be fairly good at it. And we talk about that. So knowing how long that life change takes is important. Um, and then what triggers that change? What are the key drivers that are getting results for your people? You also need to know that because it may be that you have to trigger some of those drivers. You have to be the guide that makes those things happen so that they can progress. And if you don't have mechanisms in place in your business to educate and support your members so that they achieve success with your product, then they won't stick around. This is where the CSA retention piece is really, really important. CSA retention doesn't just magically happen. It happens in the CSA farms that have some intentional strategies in place to make sure that their customers get to the finish line, that they get the, the product promise. So let's wrap up. I want you to start talking more about your product's promise and results and less about its features. People don't buy your product for the features. They're buying for the results. So commit to getting them the results that they want and articulating them and people will buy. That's all I got today, my friends. Thank you so much for joining me. I want to wish you a very Merry Christmas. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the subscribe button and you can grab the show notes at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 87. I will catch you next week for another episode of the My Digital Farmer podcast. Until then, tell all your friends about the podcast. Have a wonderful Christmas and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Oh, 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 oh,